it was kind of fun when Brian asked me to speak because it gave me an opportunity just to think back on my life. Is that better? Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, just thinking about my life. Like, my life has been profoundly shaped by discipleship in ways that, you know, in day-to-day -day life, I just hadn't really considered. But God has brought people into my life from an early age who had a great vision for disciple-making and also just the obedience to live that out. So a little bit more about me. I grew up in a really small town in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma, right on the Red River, a town of about 10,000 people. And then my parents just moved there for a job, so we didn't have any family in town, but they heard about this country Christian school 30 miles. Look, so commuting is not common in Oklahoma. It's even more, less common in a tiny, tiny town. So 30 miles from my house in a town of 3,000 called Atoka, this woman and her husband started this tiny country Christian school. There was like multiple grades in one room. And that's kind of how I grew up. And God brought this woman. And if you kind of knew how I grew up, you could see the bizarreness of this. She actually did undergrad at Cal Poly Slow and was trained by the navigators. And somehow her husband got a job in agriculture with the government in Atoka. And she was my like fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade teacher. So we were doing like the topical memory system. And she was teaching us stuff that she learned in college, but I didn't appreciate or really know it at the time. But looking back, I'm so grateful for her investment in us. And then later on, my youth minister, his wife, they were trained by the navigators. They came out of Tulsa. And so they just had a heart for discipling teenagers, which you know, it takes a special heart and passion to do that. And so they developed this curriculum. It was a three-year program, sophomore, junior, and senior year, where we met on Sunday nights. And then once a week, there was a, like a stay-at-home mom or a woman in our church who would meet with us. And so I learned so much. And then they told me, if you really want to learn how to be a disciple and make disciples, then you should go to the University of Oklahoma because there's this man named Max Barnett there, and he has such a vision for making disciples. So I'm so glad I heeded their advice. I went there with a really good friend of mine and I got involved in ministry there and God really used that to change the trajectory of my life. And so I'm so thankful for the people that God has used because yes, there are programs and there are certificates and there are all sorts of seminars you can go to to learn about being a disciple and making disciples, but it's the people, right? It's the people that we rub shoulders with, the life on life iron, sharpening iron that really help us know how to walk with God and what that looks like. So. I'm really honored to get to share with you just a little bit about that because there are whole books written on this. Like people get PhDs in this. We're like gonna do a drop in the bucket in the next 45 minutes, right? So I'll have some recommended books at the end, but we'll just skim the surface for the next few minutes. So I wanted to start initially just talking about the why. I feel like it's really important talking about anything to understand the why behind it. We see that Jesus modeled discipleship Bible making his entire ministry, right? Um, if you want to, to know how to make disciples, then read the Gospels. It's the best place to do it. Read it and do what Jesus did. He made it abundantly clear that it wasn't just something that he did, but it was something that he instructed us to do in his you know, famous last words. So, but I think about last words. When I was in college, I lost my dad. He died very suddenly. There was no last words. He didn't even know that he was going to pass away that day. And so I think in my imagination, so I've never been with someone when they die, but I would imagine that if someone had the mental capacity to know that this was going to be some of the last moments that they were going to have on earth, that the last words that they would say would be very weighty, right? They would be deliberate and give a lot of thought and attention to that. And usually the people who are gathered to be by those people who are breathing their last breaths are very dear to those people. And so... Think about that. Like, what was closest to Jesus' heart? Like, well, that would be what you would communicate on your deathbed, right? What was closest to your heart? Because that's what people are going to remember those last words. And what was closest to Jesus' heart, right? We get to see in every gospel and in the gospel of Acts, the Great Commission, right? So Matthew 28, 18 through 20. So I'm going to read it off the screen because I've memorized different translation. I'm old enough that the translation has changed. You, you too will reach that age and be like, what, there's a new edition? Um, so I just copied and pasted this new edition from online. So Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. 
So after intentionally spending his life on earth with these 11 men, Jesus said, now go. Go what I did with you. That was his mega strategy for reaching the world, right? Make disciples. So we see Jesus' strategy really clearly laid out in Mark, the Gospel of Mark 3, 14. It says, he appointed 12, designating them as apostles, that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach. It's that with him principle. Some of you may have heard that. I'm sure Brian and Morgan and others have mentioned that to you, but that key prepositional phrase right there, with him. So they shared life with him. They ate meals with him. Likely they slept in close quarters together. They celebrated feasts and festivals. They traveled together. It wasn't just the one-on-one at the coffee shop like we can be accustomed to today, but it was really life on life. They were with him. And you also see this modeled in the life of Paul. This is one of my absolute favorite verses. Because I think of this Paul as like this really manly, macho man. He endured so much. He was so tough, right? Like, I don't know many people who can survive shipwrecks. And I just all, I couldn't survive, let's be honest. Like, I'm a whoop. I would, if you know, if you read the Oregon Trail, like, I would have died of dysentery like the second day. You know, but Paul, this man, this tough guy, says this. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 8, having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. Like, it is evident without a shadow of a doubt how Paul felt about them, right? He delighted in him. They were dear to him. He said, I love you without saying I love you, didn't he? Like, they knew how much he cared about them. So you see this picture of it's not just like passing on information, it's a life. It's the gospel and it's your life. It's not just one or the other. So think beyond, when you think of discipleship, you can also often just get that idea in your mind of like, this is what I do for an hour on Tuesday mornings at 11 a.m. And that's not what making disciples looks like. It's so much more than that. You know, it's grocery shopping, it's cooking together, it's LAX runs. Do you guys do LAX runs? Is that too far? Ontario airport runs, right? If someone asks you to take them to LAX, it's like, how much do I love you? <laughs> I think of that where I am. I can't imagine from Riverside, right? But it's, it's the showing up in people's lives to the, to the poetry readings. I have been to a poetry reading, an, an acapella concert, like all these different things that are important to people. You're like, I can't believe I'm doing this. I never thought in a million years I'd be doing this. But it's important to them. The engineering presentations, I didn't study engineering. I don't really understand engineering, but I have gone and looked at displays and just stood there in blissful ignorance as they explained to me this very important project that they spent months on, right? But showing up in people's lives and sharing life with them, those are the important things, and that's what people remember, right? Those are the things that you guys remember as well. So our heart struggles in really getting to know people doesn't as much happen in a manufactured environment like over a chai tea latte, right? You can get to know someone that way, but you get to know a lot more about someone when you like visit their home, when you go and meet their parents, you're like, oh, I understand so much more. You know, this so much more is making sense. Um, if people ask you to do something with them or come home with them for a meal or something, I would say shuffle things around and do what you can because that will give you insight into their lives and that bringing that will be so helpful as you are investing in them. So we see in this verse from Paul that it is about sharing the gospel in our lives that, and that people are not projects. There was this lady that I met with at OU and I bless her, she's a wonderful woman, we still keep in touch, but I think maybe the approach wasn't what I needed because we would meet and she'd pull out a binder and I just felt like I was like this, I was like a homework assignment and I, I hated it, I'll be honest. I just didn't know what to do with it. And um, that was not her intention, but that was kind of how I perceived it. I don't think binders are bad. I think it's important to take notes, but I think just communicating that you are not a project to me. You are not something on a to-do list. I'm not gonna check this box and then go on throughout my day. You matter to me. You are valuable to me, and I want to be a part of your life more than just this time once a week. In fact, if you can get time, outside of just the once a week, that you would see, maybe you go to the same church together. Or I, I, I'm kind of confused. I'm, I know CV changed its structure a lot. I know you guys have chapel. I'm not sure what else you have, but maybe in the same Bible study or different things like that, but getting more cross-contamination than just that like Chick-fil-A. I'm trying to think what you have on your campus. I know you have a Chick-fil-A. <laughs> I'm on to 
and a lot of other things. So you know, a lot of other places to hang out, student unions and things like that. But you want to open your life to them as well, right? It's not a one-sided relationship, right? And so you want them to know who you are, your struggles, your weaknesses, your doubts, your fears, right? So you set the pace in vulnerability because if you're asking them to share about their life, it only makes sense that they would want to know about your life. Howard Hendricks has this great quote that if you want someone to bleed, this is kind of graphic, then you have to hemorrhage, right? And ouch, but you've got to go first in setting the pace, right? And letting them into your life. And, and typically, usually people will reciprocate in my kind. Um, so it also means learning to ask great questions. This is not a strength of mine, but there are lots of great books and resources. I mean, I'll just be honest, I'm so old. Google didn't exist for part of my college career. So you have Google. So Google great questions and just begin to memorize some. It will really help you get to know people. Um, so I highly recommend um, sharing life with people and not just inserting them into a small portion of your calendar week. Does that make sense? So we talked about the why. I think it's really important to know the why before we move on to the how, because if you don't understand the why, then you're not going to do the how, right? That's going to fade pretty quickly. So how, how would you go about making disciples? Luke 640 tells us a student is not above. Oh, sorry. I have a student written down. I'll read it off here. A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone after he has been fully trained will be like his teacher. So it's very sobering, isn't it? Like we reproduce who we are, the good, the bad, the ugly, the bad habits that we wish we didn't have, you know, People are seeing that and they're noticing that and that's we're reproducing who we are. So the first call on our life is that Mark 3.14, that Mark right, to be with Jesus. Because without being with Jesus, we have nothing to offer people, right? They do not need more Aaron. The world does not need another Aaron or more of me. They need Jesus, right? And so we want to be people who point people to Jesus and not to ourselves. And we need to be spending time with Jesus. Um, also, just the reality that Kind of like maybe you would taunt your brothers or sisters like it takes one to make one right so if you aren't a disciple of jesus you're not going to be able to make disciples of jesus right so disciple dallas willard who was a professor at usc back in the day an amazing man to find disciples really an apprentice and i know you guys are at university like you may know friends who are in sort of apprentice program but it's a really neat way of describing what disciple really means in a word in a world that we don't use that word very often and so we want to be apprentices of jesus ourselves and help other people become apprentices of jesus so i've got to be setting the pace in that in my own life i can't be asking people to do things and be things that i'm not willing to pay the price to be myself right so just some some suggestions along the way for what this could look like Three suggestions. So the first thing I would say is, sorry, okay, yeah, thank you. Set the, see the goal. So you wanna see the goal. I mean, that's important. If any of you are on sports teams, you're like, the goal is the Super Bowl, right? The Super Bowl's coming up, or did any of you guys, I guess the big bowl game is coming up on Monday. My team did not do well in the bowl game, but we will not talk about that. Um, but it's fine because life is more than sports. But Paul really paints this great, clear picture of what the goal is in Colossians 1, 28 and 29. It says, we proclaim him, we proclaim Jesus, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works in me. So the goal is to be like Jesus, right? The goal is not to reproduce myself and other people. The goal is Jesus. So that's really helpful just to remind yourself. Sometimes we lose our balls and weeds. And like, what is, what am I doing? What am I about? The goal is Jesus, right? So the second thing is to set the pace. So we want to teach out of lifestyle and not out of head knowledge. So that means that we research scripture memory more times than we quit it, just because we're all going to struggle with it all along the way. But it's not like you should do this, even though I don't do this, because it would be good for you. It's like, well, I'll be honest. That is not what I did and I regret it because of X, Y, and Z. So when you're honest and vulnerable and letting people in, like you may not have not done it that way, but you may have learned the hard way and they don't have to learn the hard way because of your example. Does that make sense? And then the last thing we talked about already, we're gonna talk about it again, is share your life. 
share your life. The struggles, the conflict, the doubts. You know, your Christmas break may have been a little like mine, and there was a lot of dying to self, you know? Um, and sometimes I did not do that well. I had a lot of opportunities to die to self, but I did not always die to self, right? So when people ask about your break, sharing how it really was, not just like, oh yeah, it was great. I got the Air Jordans I wanted or whatever. Um, but to share, you have to open your life up to people. So the next thing is just kind of how do you decide who to disciple, selecting disciples, right? Like there's a process, you know a lot of people, but how do you move beyond the, just that conversating to something beyond that? How many of you guys are freshmen? Oh, I love freshmen. I work with freshmen at USC. So um, I'm so glad you guys are here. So I don't want you to, to hear that like, you can't disciple anyone because you're a freshman. Not that at all. I think freshman year sets the tone for the rest of college. You have the opportunity to, to lay a, a really firm foundation. Likely this is going to be more of the year where people are pouring into you, but you're getting training to be reaching out to people in your hall and in the cafeteria and things like that. And God has put the mission field everywhere, even at a place like Cal Baptist, which is very different than a place like USC. So, but opportunities to minister everywhere. So when you're thinking about how and who to build into, you kind of have to think of it like a funnel. And none of these ideas are original with me, friends. I have learned these. A lot of these from my boss, Neil Walker, who's going to be leading a workshop at five, so you can go hear from him again. But he gets the credit for most of this information because I've learned some things along the way from him. So we want to be people who love everyone. You kind of have to think of this as a funnel. Um, so. Our heart, and God's heart, is to love people, right? That's how people are going to know that we're followers of him, is how we love each other. So we want to be people who love. Um, but we also want to be people, we don't have time to train everyone, right? Like you guys likely take a full course, so some of you are working. Most of you have a lot going on. And so we want to be people who love everyone. There's going to be a, a great number of people that you're going to be able to help. There's lots of opportunities to help people. Mm -hmm but you're only gonna have time to train a few people. And that's hard, right? You just wanna be able to train everyone. And we'll unpack that a little bit, why it's just not possible to train everyone. But I don't know about you, but there've been times in my life when I have been rather flaky. And maybe you can relate to that, or maybe you maybe know some flaky people. Um, and so flaky people are great. We've all, we all can relate to that at some point. but. Flaky people fall in the category of loving and maybe opportunities to help, but we don't train people who are not committed. So a, kind of a nihilism that he says is that we train people from commitment. We don't train people to commitment. So I wanna unpack that a little bit because it can sound a little bit harsh. Is that we, we want to invest concentrated time in people who are already showing that they are in, right? That they want to pay the price because training is costly. Any of you who've ever been on a sports team, you know, it hurts. It's a sacrifice of time. There's a lot that goes into that. And so you get cut from a, a, track, a track team ride if you don't show up to practice, right? If you are not committed, you get cut. And so not that we cut people out from growing in Christ. That's not at all what I'm saying. But when you are looking at someone's life, are they still considering if Jesus is worth it? Are they still considering if they want to grow in Christ. There's lots of opportunities to help them, but the people that you want to train are people who are in. And just because the caveat here is people can say they're in and you can invest time in them, and over time, their choices will be revealed. And that's one of the heartbreaking things in ministry, right, is when people decide the cost is just too high, I don't want to pay the price. And so I think I would use great discernment in making this decision, I would invite your leaders in as you're deciding who to invest in, but I would do this so with sober judgment because when you are giving someone your time, you're giving them your life, right? And so you don't have the opportunity to give your life to everyone, so you have to be selective. And that goes against like every fiber of my being because Neil pointed this out to me once. I don't like to label people because I don't want to be labeled. Like I don't want people to think, to put me in a category, right? It's like, no, no, I defy categories. Like, like the Enneagram, I'm like, oh, I'm okay with it, but I don't really want to talk about it. I don't know what I am, right? Because I just, I, I can't tell. 
But so invite other people. I, and I would say, take time to really pray through opportunities that you have to invest in people. God is the one who knows people's hearts. We cannot see people's hearts. And I'm grateful for people who took a risk on me because I have been all sorts of squirrely and flaky, right? But I'm grateful that they prayed about it and God led them to invest. And I will be eternally grateful for that. And so, does this make sense? Do you have questions? I want to pause here. Are there questions? I don't want that to be fuzzy to be like, yes. Uh, I think you took some time to explain this already, but could you explain like what training people to commitment is over training them, training people from commitment? So um, that's a good question. So Noah asked, how do you train people to commitment, not from? So um, so training takes a, a, a variety of different ways. And I think oftentimes, especially at your age and stage in life, you're mostly going to be training peers. And that's going to be a little bit harder to see. So. I'm going to touch on that, Noah, on the next point, and then if it's not clear, we'll go back to your question, okay? So some characteristics of, of people to look for, I don't love this acronym, but it is like the most popular one, is to look for people who are fat, right? <laughs> fat people. And so people who are faithful, you know, Proverbs talks about many a man proclaims his own loyalty, but a faithful man who can find faithfulness is a rare commodity in our world today. People who do and follow through with what they say, that's a rarity. And so we want to look for people who show faithfulness, right? Also looking for people who are available. Like many of you may be taking like heavy load and have an internship. So the time that you have available to invest in people may be very early in the morning. And so our people that are looking to grow really making themselves available to grow. It's like, no, I want to grow, but I do not want to grow before 11 a.m. in the morning. Like, that's, that's when I'm willing to grow, right? No, but we make ourselves available, because you're only in college for four, maybe a few more years than that, depending on your program. But the rest of your life, you're gonna have to get up early. Like, right, if you're gonna meet with your pastor at your church, you're likely gonna do that before work, and then have a commute, and that kind of thing. So learning to, to make yourself available now will serve you tremendously in the years to come. And also, like, teachable, like, how do they respond to Jesus? Like, with the hard sayings of Jesus, like what we've been hearing today, you know, the nations are there, the nations are here. I don't know what the, the population is like at CBU, but at USC, the nations are everywhere. You can meet people from any country. And so, God has given some really clear commands, and in our day and age, some really unpopular things, right? Some things that, um, we just kind of distance ourselves from, well, that's in the Bible, but, um, so are we teachable? Are we, are we humble and, and willing to live by what God says and not by what the world says? And I, I thought this, was, this verse was just so key um, in describing that in Acts 4.13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that those men had been with Jesus. Like, do people take note that you have been with Jesus? Like, I would love for people to, to, to think that about me, that I would live a life in such a way that they would know that I have been with Jesus. You know, these men responded to Jesus, but they were also captivated and obedient to Jesus. And that was evident in their life. And this is actually a very trying time in life. And then Paul goes on to say in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So it's just been my experience. I'm a people pleaser and I really love, I'm an extrovert, so COVID was brutal. So brutal. I actually broke down crying on my boss when he made staff meetings online. I was like, I cannot live like this. I have to have people. Um, people, people in my life, but you can't force people to grow. I don't know if you've ever wanted something for someone that they haven't wanted for themselves, that's really hard. Really, really hard. But I have spent some long hours um, trying to convince people that this is what they want. They do want Jesus. And I, can conv I cannot convince them of that, right? We can't change people's minds. The Holy Spirit can't, but I can't. And so reminding ourselves that when we spend time with people who do really not want to grow, it's very unlikely that they're going to pass that on to other people. 
And the goal in discipleship is that it doesn't end with you, it doesn't end with them, but the, the multiplication process, right? Like we don't want to even just be making disciples. We want to be making disciple makers, right? We want to be investing our lives in people who are going to make disciples, but also make disciple makers so that this world is filled with the knowledge of who Jesus is. But I have spent a lot of hours trying to train when I probably should have just been helping. Does that make sense? So just kind of realizing where they are and how best to help them. Because then they're frustrated too because then they feel like, well, I, I, if I say this, then she'll move on to a different topic. I'm kind of tired of talking about this again. Right, so just saying things to get out of the conversation with me. So just re the reminder that you have such a limited amount of time in all of life. I know it doesn't feel like that, but man, you just blink and so much of your life goes by. And your years at Cal Baptist are gonna fly by as well, especially even those of you who are freshmen, you're gonna blink and you're gonna be seniors. Like, how did this happen? So I would just really encourage you to be very prayerful about who you're investing in because you want to invest in people who are committed to passing that on to other people so that the, the discipleship reproduction model continues on and on and on. So I would highly encourage you to ask for input. You will never regret asking for, I, I have not regretted asking for input. I mean, people don't always tell me what I want to hear and there's sometimes people give me input that I, I don't agree with, but. There's just a lot of protection in getting input. And there's just things that other people see. I can be very, uh, you probably don't even understand, Pollyanna, you know, you've probably never even seen that movie. Yeah. Like rose colored glasses, no, just see the best. And so I need someone else to be like, okay, well, this, you might want to consider this. Have you thought about this? Have you noticed this? Because I kind of stop noticing things when I see things I don't want to see, right? So I, uh, I think that'll work itself out. So it's really easy and it's very enjoyable to meet with people who respond to me, you know, who are similar to me and we have a great time together. But those aren't necessarily the people that I need to be training and investing in. Like, we want to be training and investing in people who respond to Jesus, not to us. And sometimes you're going to have the immense joy of investing in people who are very similar to you, where you just mesh well and the hours just fly by and you couldn't, you can't wait till the next time you get to see that person. And other times you're like, I don't get you at all, um, but you're on my ministry team this year and I get assigned to meet with you and I'm going to get to learn from you. And I think sometimes those are the richest relationships because those can be more dependent on God and prayerful because there's not that connection, that ease of personality, right? And so we want to be people who are leaning into God to know how to invest because on our own, we have no idea what people need. God alone sees people's hearts. So I would really recommend you learn from my mistakes. And when you're maybe asking someone like, hey, would you like to get some time together? Because it's January, right? You have the whole semester in front of you. I would not say, pretend, oh, what is your name? Faith. Faith, okay, I was gonna use no ones like that weird. Pretend Faith and I, I'm really excited. She's in my Bible study. She is faithful. She is available. She is teachable. I am so encouraged with faith. So I think I'm going to start getting some consistent time with faith and helping her in some areas. What would not be the good thing to do, which I have done before, is like, Faith, do you want to meet this semester? Like, don't do that. Don't do that. Say, Faith, do you want to meet until Valentine's Day? Why don't for the next four weeks, we get together on like Tuesdays at 3 p.m., and we'll talk about prayer, because you mentioned that in my group that you wanted to grow in prayer. Give yourself an out, give them an out. Do the four week thing, don't do the full semester thing, because I had some very long semesters with people who I was so excited about. And I just, it became very apparent that they weren't, it just makes awkward, right? So it gives them, maybe they're, not, they're no longer interested, but they don't want to tell you, and you don't know how to talk to them about it. So just initially, say four weeks, just do a month. People can do things for a month and then see how that goes. See, okay, is faith, this is funny, is faithful, faithful, available, and teachable? That's going to come out more and more the more time you get there. Okay, so faith's not, I, because I work with freshmen, this has been very helpful because I can get very excited about someone. And, okay, they're just not ready for training yet. They're ready for a lot of help, and I'm happy to help, but they're just not ready for training. Training is what I 
get to do typically with more of the ministry team leaders, but I get to help a ton of freshmen, and that's so much fun, but it helps in my mind to realize where they're at, because it keeps my expectations where they need to be, right? And so I'm not expecting them to, to always follow through with all the, the assignments or the homework. They're young, they're new believers, you know, meeting people where they are, and that will minister so much to them as you're patient with them, and they don't see the disappointment in your eyes like, again? What are you doing with your time? Or your, you know, those kinds of frustrations. So, you know, Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So, again, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. You have a limited amount. And so invite God in. God has some great ideas of how he wants you to invest your time while you're at CBU and far beyond that. So consider wisely what you're filling your time with. So the next thing I would like to just touch briefly on is like what to do when you are getting together with someone. What, I mean, you could be weeding a garden together and, and this could work. You don't have to necessarily be at your cafeteria or Starbucks or wherever you are. So when you're kind of outlining what that time together should look like, three things. I would say look back. So you kind of want to look back at the week. Like what happened since you've last seen them? Catch up on what they've been up to, how their applications have been since the last time that you met, like the things that you discussed and how they're putting that into practice. So this means you have to keep track of what you cover, right? You need to like keep notes and know, okay, I assigned this to be able to check in on that. Like I, I told you, we agreed, you're gonna read Tyranny of the Urgent. Okay, you didn't read it, okay. Let's read it again this week. So looking back, um, be careful that the, the time you spend with them doesn't all just become catch-up time because they can easily just be like, oh, goodness, da 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 um, So you do want to have some of that because, again, people are not projects of people. But. And then you also want to spend some time looking up. So that could be looking at a passage of Scripture. That could be practicing a tool or a discipline, maybe uh, the hand illustration the wheel, I'm not quite sure what all you guys are familiar with. Um, lots of different illustrations to use. Um, how to share the gospel. So spending some time intentionally looking at something in scripture or something that will be helpful. And then looking ahead. Okay, we can pray together. Let's look at what is in store for your next week. I'll have you have that big midterm tomorrow. Um, discuss like the application, plan for it, and then set up the time for next week. Maybe you're like, oh yeah, next week I have this presentation, so can we bump the time? So if you break it up into like 15 minutes of looking back and then maybe 30 minutes of looking up and then maybe 15 minutes of looking ahead, if you have an hour or something, thinking through it like that. Sometimes it helps to have an idea in your mind of where you're going and what to cover and how that should look. And some ideas on what to cover. And again, this is something I've learned from Neil is CVS, character, vision, and skills. So character, like who are they becoming? Our character matters. Are there, maybe there's perspectives that need to change or lies that they're believing about themselves or lies they're believing about God. Maybe opportunities to grow that they're just not seeing at the time. So working on character. Another thing would be vision. So are they able to see these opportunities that God has in front of them? You know, sometimes we need someone else to see things in our life. Like you have spent how many hours this week on Netflix or whatever, like, what are you giving your time to? Because what you're giving your time to, you're giving your life to. So having an outside perspective can be really helpful. Um, and the last thing is just skills. So there's, like, practical tools, techniques or habits. Last year for our ministry team, we meet a couple times a month, we spent 10 minutes every week looking at a different life skill. And I did this very impassioned talk about sponges. I have very strong opinions about sponges. Um, but they like harbor a ton of bacteria and you can get really sick. And so clean your sponge, toss your sponge. Like, and so just life skills, right? It's like when on meal planning and like all hospitality, but we started off the semester with sponges and that left a very deep impact on people because I was very passionate about <laughs> actually not even using a sponge. Um, so it's really, cause it's really funny. So life skills too, you can teach people like discipleship is all of life. It's not just, your, their spiritual life. We don't want to compartmentalize, right? All of life. And so learning how to, you know, put air in your tires, in your car, or how to make sure that 
you like know how much oil is in your car. Like there's like life skills that will save you so much money, or finances, right? Budgeting, saving, spending, like all these different kinds of things that scripture really speaks to, but sometimes we wanna focus on one aspect and neglect a whole other aspect, so. So when you're helping someone to build a habit or discipline, sometimes it's like, I wanna be like, just do it. Like what, how does it make sense? Just like get up in the morning and exercise. Why is that so hard, right? But we know it's hard, right? That alarm goes off, we're like, no. It's not another day again. So Max Barnett, who was Brian and I's um, campus minister, taught us this. So he said, when you're trying to build a habit or discipline in some, with someone else, this is something to do. So tell them why. The why is so important. Tell them why. So then it's going to last beyond their time with me. Because you guys are going to graduate, right? And then you show them how. So tell them why, and you show them how. So then you do it, and they watch. So I'm going to go to Costco and fill up my tire with air, and you're going to come with me, and we're going to learn the PSI and look where to see all that. And this is a life skill. You need to know this, right? So we'll do it together, and then get them started. So they do it, and you watch. Oh no, that's not how you do. It. You got to make sure that the thing is totally on there. Or you're going to just leak air everywhere. I mean, this works with like scripture memory and building a habit of a quiet time, all sorts of things. Any habit or discipline. So tell them why. Show them how get them started, and then keep them going. So then they do it on their own, right? So you're checking in, seeing how that's going, and then teaching them how to reproduce that in the life of other people. So how do you then teach someone else how to do that, how to start a quiet time, how to memorize scripture? Think about that. If any of you guys think quickly on your feet, what is a lasting lesson that you learned from someone who is investing in you, and what was the why behind it? Do you guys have any... Quick thoughts on that? A lasting lesson that you learned from somebody and, and the why behind it. Yes? Giving grace to yourself and your mistakes. Yeah, she said giving grace to yourself. It's important. We can be really hard on ourselves. So, Yeah, but thinking through things that you've learned from other people and how helpful that was for you. Because remember, again, it's so important to pass on our lives. It's not just verbal vomit. It's not just a binder of information. Here, read this and you'll be fine. It's not like that at all. Um, we're working with people. We're, we're not checking things off a to-do list, right? And you don't have all the answers, and you will not have all the answers. I do not have anywhere near the answers, but you have the opportunity to ask other people to help. Okay, let's go to my pastor, and let's ask him a question, because I don't understand this either, and I would love to learn what he has to say. So when I, when I was a part of a summer training program, I was a little bit older than you guys in college, and one of the ladies that was helping with the girls, she said, what do you think about discipleship like this? It's, it's one beggar showing another beggar where to get bread. So I'm still in the same spot. I'm just a little bit farther along. I just know where the source of life is. I, I just know it's in Jesus. So let's go together. Let's keep going to him and getting full in him. And so. It's not me having the answers and imparting the answers. It's no, let's go together, let's learn together, we're in this together, we're sharpening each other. So not thinking of yourself as a teacher. So you're not like, got the chalkboard. I mean, sometimes you will have, you know, draw it on a napkin or something like that, but for the most part, it's alongside each other. And there are times when you feel like you have nothing to give, and I think those are probably some of the best times because they keep us dependent on God and very prayerful. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything is coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. And he also writes in 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 7, what after all is Apollos and what is Paul, only servant through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Did you catch that? Like, our role is a servant. We are faithful servants of the King of Kings, and that's what we get to do. So we get to play lots of different roles. Think of it like, I don't, we don't live in an agrarian culture, so the watering, the seed things, it might be like a puzzle. That your life is this huge, I don't know how many piece puzzle, right? And you may get to put in a couple pieces, and someone else gets to put in a couple pieces in their life. And that's a privilege, right? You're a link in a chain, but you don't get to put in all the pieces. That's, that's not your role. And it's very humbling to be at conferences like this because there may be people that you've been investing in and you've been talking about, like, how to have a quiet time. And it just seems to go in one ear, out the other. But they'll meet with you next week and be like, 
okay, I just heard this amazing thing about a quiet time. You're like, we've been trying to get you to do this, but there's just different keys that unlock different locks. And so it's, it's humbling, right? It's a team approach. You're not going to do all the work. And that's a really good thing because there's a body of Christ and we all get to help each other, right? So I would encourage you as a wrap up that for the rest of your life, you have answers to these two simple questions. So the first one is, who is investing in you? You need people who are investing deeply in you. And then who are you investing in? Who are people that you can be investing in? I think these two questions should be at the forefront of your mind for the rest of your life, not just while you're in college, but that you would just make an effort to be someone who continues to grow for the rest of your life and invest in other people. So just some closing advice from someone who's just a little bit farther down the road than you is to ask questions and to don't stop asking questions. Even when you think you know the answer, I would say ask the question. That's probably when you'd ask the question the most. And then to pray for those you're investing in. Make it a matter of prayer. When I was at OU, the girl who was discipling a group of us, my sophomore year, commuted, which OU commuted is very different than USC commuting. But um, she told us that God had just put on her that she would not listen to the radio while she drove to campus in the morning, but she would pray for us. And that, I still, I mean, that's been a lot of years, and that still stuck with us. She loved us enough that she prayed for us. And so I'm so grateful for that. I mean, and don't think it depends on you, right? You're a link in the chain. You get to put some puzzle pieces in, but it's not about you. It's not about you. The goal is Jesus, remember? So just some recommended readings for those of you who want to just learn more about this, some great books. I really love The Invested Life by Joel Rosenberg. He's an East Coast guy. Uh, got some great illustrations. And then Jim Peterson went to be with Jesus recently. He's an amazing man, an old navigator. He wrote a book called Living Proof that I couldn't recommend enough. Um, Disciples Are Made Not Bored, a classic by Walt Henriksen. The Lost Art of Disciple Making by Leroy Imes. And then I would just make it a habit of your life to read biographies. I think you will be more encouraged reading biographies than any other kind of book because the longer you walk with God, the more you realize how high the cost is. And for people who have gone before us and lived well, it can be very encouraging to read how they didn't give up when things were hard. And we just, we need that example in our life. And so I have a commute. I only live 12 miles from USC, but it can take a long time. So I just have the LA Public Library app and I listen to all sorts of biographies and things. I just finished a great one. I'll just give, this is free of charge. I listened to Lillian Trasher, which is a very unfortunate name, um, but an incredible woman. So it's a series called Christian Heroes Then and Now, but you will be so blown away by her life. Call me. I'll give you my phone and we can talk about it. I need some people, more people to read it so we can talk about it. But she just blew me. I had never heard of her and a friend recommended it. So read biographies. It will minister to you. And I would say find a church that just values disciple making. It has it as a core value that's really lived out. To find a great church that lives it out and also the people that are closest to you, your running mates in life, but those are people who also are disciples themselves and making disciples. It is just my opinion, this is not in scripture, I've just lived longer than you, that if those two components are not a part of your life, it's going to be pretty hard, if not impossible, to make disciples because we, vision leaks, right? And so we need that kind of encouragement and reinforcement in our life. And so find a great church and find some friends that are like, no, no, we're going to run hard after Jesus and we're going to invest our lives and other people because that is the high calling on our life. So, we have a few minutes for questions if your tummies aren't growling voraciously. Yes, Faith. Uh, thank you for sharing a lot about just how we can train people. I'm wondering if you can clarify a little bit more what the difference looks like of helping versus training. What might be some things that you do to help? That is a good question. Um, I think for me, helping is less of a commitment. And so, like I said, the example of you, like, let's work on prayer for the next four. It's more short-term help or maybe a one-off conversation. So sometimes I'll get to speak at our, like, Thursday night. We do, like, a worship night at USC, and so I'll speak about something, and then a student will want to meet afterwards and talk more through that. So it's it's more, it's less of a, a commitment long-term. Like, we're not meeting every week this semester. It's more just meeting that, that kind of personal one-off need. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, it's 
so that was, that was exactly her question. Um, I feel like helping is a little um, less long term and more of like a specific need in helping helping them get to the place where they want the training. So the girls, so this is kind of how USC is structured is I lead our freshman ministry. So I have three student leaders that I meet. They don't have a choice. They're like assigned to me. I'm assigned to them, they're assigned to me. Those are the girls that I'm training. And so I have said, you know, for this next semester, I've already, this is what we're gonna work on. And if there's an expectation there, it doesn't have, I'm not saying it has to look like that, but it's just kind of what it looks like in my life. Um, and then there's freshman girls that I meet with fairly consistently, but the expectation level of them always doing the homework or finishing the reading or is much lower. So we're just working on entry level, like, you know, spending time with God every day, um, not pissing your roommate out, you know, just like, <laughs> just like, bait, just learning to walk with God and, and invite him into all areas of your life. So for the girls that I'm really discipling, there's a, more of a commitment to, for both of us that we've made. Is that what you're Any other questions? Any good restaurants around? <laughs>